Okay, folks, I'm just to make sure this is recording. So I'll be recording that I'm making sure it's recording. There we go. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Ken Rosenthal, and tonight we're going to talk about cottontails. Um, uh, one other thing I do want to remind everybody, I'm when I'm in this mode, it's very, it's not easy for me to see the chat or if somebody raises their hand. Um, we're all adults here, um, so if you have a question, please feel free to um, unmute and uh, catch my attention. I'll try to answer your question the moment you have it. It's usually uh, it's sometimes much better to um, answer the question when we're on the topic than down the road or at the end. Um, so I just want to make sure that everything's clear. Um, Again, uh, I'm Ken Rosenthal. I'm the park naturalist here at Gulf Branch Nature Center. This is tonight's deep dive is going to be about our eastern cottontails, and I'll, I'll delve a little bit into some other rabbits, but we're going to talk about them. Um, when I started doing um, my, my my deep dives, this is uh, one of the things I, I really wanted to do was just talk about um, some of these creatures, these organisms, these plants, whatever they are, um, that are so familiar to us that they almost, in many ways, escape notice. There's there's a lot of of really neat stuff about some of these animals. And again, you know, I grew up with rabbits, um, found out I had chicken pox because of a rabbit. We all stood up at the breakfast table to look out the back window at a rabbit. And while we were looking, my dad was like, you have red spots on your neck. And there was my week off for chicken pox when I was in uh, kindergarten. So, you know, it's, it's the little memories like that. Um, but to, to tell you a lot about rabbits, to do a program like this, I really had to do some reading and, and learn some new stuff. And there's some interesting things about rabbits that I did not know before I did this. And so I'm hoping to share uh, with you some new things, but also to give depth to uh, one of those critters that, you know, we see and we're like, yeah, there's a rabbit. They got long ears, they run from everything, and they eat plants. Uh, and maybe to, to flesh that out for some people. Uh, hopefully your, your depth of rabbit knowledge maybe was a little bit more than that. Um, but uh, anyways, let's get started. Um, and rabbits have always had a, a special place in our culture. Uh, I'm a big cartoon person, so of course my my cultural reference is going to start with a few cartoons. It's important for you to notice that um, you might be counting and see that there's nine rabbits up there, but there's actually ten and Harvey is invisible. Uh, and some of you will get that and some of you will Google it later. Um, but rabbits have always had... Um, you know, one of those, those special places. They're obviously they're they're you know they're herbivores. They're not very fierce or scary. And they're not going to envenom envenomate you um, or or cause any really bad things. And so they've always had these um, very lovable characters named after them. Um, in many um, cultural histories, uh, some rab sometimes the rabbit has also been a, a trickster. Um, we've seen the rabbit everywhere. Here's the rabbit on the moon. Um, uh, but that rabbit trickster is really important. Um, that middle character there, Br'er Rabbit, there's some a lot of, of interesting history behind who Br'er Rabbit is um, and, and how that's changed over the years. And that's definitely worth getting into. It's not it's a controversial subject. It's not something I'm uh, going to tackle in this program, but it is a very interesting cultural um, character uh, that has a lot of, of history from North America. Um, that I think is really is really worth an investigation. Uh, and on the left here is uh, one example of a, a trickster rabbit. This is a, a tale from West Africa. Um, one of my favorite stories is about Rowino. I hope I say that correctly. And it, this, it's an Iroquois story, and it's about whoops, a little jumpy finger there. And it's an Iroquois story about how the um, creator was making all the creatures and. Um, they all took their turn and they were all able to tell, they were all essentially formless and they were able to tell the creator what they wanted to look like. And when it was rabbit's turn, he came up and he said he went long legs, run real fast and big fangs and big claws so that he could be a fierce predator. And while Rowena was doing this for the rabbit and stretching out his legs, Owl kept interrupting uh, and to the point where uh, Owl irritated Rowena, he turned on Owl and um, was very rough with Owl and yelled at Owl and Owl flew away and never showed his face during the day again because he was so embarrassed. Um, and when the creator turned back, the rabbit was gone because he had also scared the rabbit. And so to this day, the rabbit has his, his long hind legs, but no fangs, uh, no sharp claws. And he also, and the rabbit also hides um, from loud noises and, and runs away very quickly. And so I, it's always been one of my favorite stories. So these, you know, the rabbit has been um, a really big part of, of, of many different cultures around the world. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Again, we're going to focus on the Eastern Cottontail, which is our, our rabbit you'll find here in Arlington. Um, 
Oh, and I, I almost don't, I don't want to forget, uh, you know, rabbits have also been uh, an important source of food for, for many people. Uh, this is an old picture depicting um, a couple of women here, and they are hunting rabbits, and they're using a ferret. Uh, the woman on the right is holding a ferret and sending it into the burrow to flush out the rabbits, which they're then catching with a net. Um, and, and to be honest, you know, rabbits have been an important source of food since Hobbit times. Um, hopefully that... That was funny. I like my little jokes, but it's tough when no one's, uh, everybody's muted. Um, but let's get, let's get back to the, um, the, the tree of life. Let's get back to where the, uh, the rabbit, uh, in particular, the Eastern cottontail falls in our, uh, in our taxonomy here. Um, so I think hopefully we'll all agree they're in the animal kingdom and they're, wow, it's really jumpy today. Uh, and they're, um, chordates, which means they have backbones with, uh, a nerve cord. Um, they are mammals covered in fur, and they are legomorphs, not rodents. And I hear this a lot. Um, and they have very similar, you know, teeth, and that's where they get it from. Um, legomorphs include the, <clears throat> um, what you call it, uh, American pika here on the left. This is a, a picture from Colorado. Adorable little thing, kind of looks mouse-like, but it's actually uh, in, the, in the same order as rabbits. And they um, have also been called uh, whistle hares. Um, they're these tiny little guys that will sit there, and they're very hard to spot. Once you spot them, you know, you, you can get on them, but you take a little work to find one. But they'll sit there on these little rock perches and whistle really loud, and it's fun. This is um, uh, Rocky Mountain National Park out in Colorado where I got this picture. Um, uh, this is not my picture, but this is a snowshoe hare uh, here in the middle. And then on the right, this is a marsh rabbit. Uh, so similar. Again, these are all in the same order, uh, but these are not our cottontails. Uh, and again, like as I mentioned, uh, rabbits pika are not rodents; they are legomorphs. Um, one way to to kind of understand this difference is if you look at their skulls. On the left, this is a, a cottontail skull. On the right, this is a uh, a beaver, and this tiny one here at the bottom is a vole. Uh, and if you look at all three, you see these gaps here between the front teeth and the rear teeth, which can can easily make one thing. Well, they're all in the same; they're all classified somewhere in the same group. They all have this diastema. Uh, and that is the gap between the teeth here. Um, but what, what you'll notice is if you turn this, the top of the uh, the rabbit skull over, if you take the top of it and turn it so that you can look at the front teeth, you'll notice that unlike all the rodents, there is a second pair of teeth in front of the, um, or in behind the, the front teeth of the rabbit there that you're not going to find in rodents. Uh, so, you know, if you're looking at skulls, obviously this is tough with a, a living critter, but if you're looking at skulls, you can find this second pair of incisors or peg teeth, as they're sometimes called, behind the front teeth. Um, if you look at yourself in the mirror and, you know, your 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 middle two teeth are your incisors, but the two on the right are all, the, uh, the two on each side of those center two are also incisors. On the rabbits, those two are simply, instead of next to the front incisors, behind them in the mouth there. Uh, I honestly can't tell you if that confers any uh, chewing or uh, biting advantage, but that is, it, for us at least, it's helpful to be able to look at those and tell the difference in the skulls. Uh, so, and then we're to the family Leporidae. Um, I don't remember the name of the family with the pikas, it starts with an O, um, but Leporidae are the rabbits and the hares, um, jackrabbits, all those critters there. So hares and jackrabbits are together and the rabbits are used separately. I think there's 11 genus in this group. Um, and they get pretty big. Um, this is, And I went to Snopes for this. I did not um, take this at face value because I've seen those pictures before. Oh, this is pretty big. I always like to show something that's kind of big when I'm talking about a group or, or a member of groups. Um, and, and oftentimes, which and again, this is a domestic bunny. I, I think it's only like 17 pounds. It looks like a lot more. It's definitely a, a big bunny. Uh, and there could be some forced perspective there making it look a little bigger than it is. But if you look at, you know, in the fossil record, your record, you'll find some larger rabbits. Um, but they're not that big. This is Nerlagus rex, or the Menorcan giant rabbit. Um, this is a really good example of island gigantism, where you'll have a uh, small species uh, that, uh, you know, uh, the species uh, on an island will get bigger and bigger because there's no natural selection against larger rabbits because there's no predators. And so in the absence of predators, the species gets bigger and bigger. It's like sometimes when you have large you might have a large species go to an island and they get smaller because there's not enough, um, I think it's because there's not enough food. And so uh, the selection is actually for uh, smaller 
uh, smaller members of that species. So this is European cottontail very down here in the lower left. Uh, very similar in size to the American cottontail. Um, and again, this is from a, a European publication, hence that that scale. Uh, if you want to throw a human into it, <clears throat> our prehistoric rabbit's not quite as big. Uh, I did a, a, a beaver program a couple months ago, and they were you know, a human-sized beaver, which is pretty neat. I uh, could not find a human-sized rabbit, though I tried. Um, Neuralegus rex. Um, and this is from uh, Menorca and Mallorca, or Majorca, I think you say Mallorca. Um, when those two islands were actually combined, that's where this, this species lived, and so that's where they were finding these fossils uh, of this uh, prehistoric um, rabbit species. And Neuralagus, this is the only species in that genus, so this is an extinct genus um, under, in the Laporte. Uh, and finally, of course, we arrive to our cute as a button little uh, eastern cottontail, and the species name is Silvalagus floridanus. Uh, apologies if you know Latin better than me. Um, you know, and a few numbers here to, to think about. The, the family of the poor day, rabbits and hares, there's 60 extant species in 11 genera. Um, I've seen that number as high as 80, and I think that just depends on whether they're counting uh, subspecies or not. There's several subspecies of the uh, eastern cottontail, for example, that, that show up on species list that I was looking at. Um, you'll find rabbits. Uh, on every continent except Antarctica. You'll find that they're native to every continent except Australia, and I'll come back to that in a second. Hopefully you caught that, uh, the difference there. Uh, we have six species in Virginia. Oh, no, we don't, because I mis I counted a uh, subspecies and didn't go back and change that, so apologies. There's five species. There's the Appalachian cottontail, black-tailed jackrabbit, eastern cottontail, marsh rabbit, and snowshoe hare. I don't think there's one shown beneath there. Um, right, so snowshoe hare, so j those five. The um, Black-tailed jackrabbit, uh, I believe, is 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 they they don't say introduced the, the website I was looking at, which I think was the National Wildlife, um, some uh, state wildlife site uh, had it as naturalized, which sounds like introduced to me. So I don't know if that means they naturally moved into the West or if they you know they, somebody introduced the jackrabbit to hunt them. Uh, the eastern cottontail and the snowshoe here both have double asterisks because they have. Uh, subspecies. So one of the lists I was looking at had a, a number actually larger than six for species of rabbits and hares, and I just want to stick with species and not get too into the weeds on that. Um, some of you may have seen these. This is not an actual Laporte. I'm sure we all understand that. Um, but if you ever want to do a, a you know, we get five minutes to spare and nothing better to do, it, it's worth a Google to look up the jackalope and, and where it came from. Uh, and obviously with somebody who's really good taxidermist and you, know, you can still find and buy these if you're so inclined and probably every other bar west of the Mississippi has a there's at least one bar for every two or three that you go to that has one of these in there somewhere. Um, but yes, jackalopes are not real. This is a very real distribution of rabbits and hares and jackrabbits around the, the world. Uh, and as I mentioned, they are not found on Antarctica and they are not native to Australia or Antarctica. So if you live in Australia and you're worried about um, small critters in vegetation, you're um, definitely concerned about the, the fact that there are rabbits there. Uh, this is the European uh, cottontail or European rabbit. Um, sorry, European rabbit. I don't think they call it the cottontail. Uh, the European rabbit was introduced in Australia. I believe it was also introduced in Britain. Uh, I read somewhere it said it took 700 years for this rabbit to move across Britain. I took it 50 years to move across Australia, and Australia has 25 times the land mass of Britain. Uh, and so this rabbit flourished in Australia, and, it, and it's a big deal. They, this is another thing that you know, I could have done a whole hour on this, although it's not really in our wheelhouse, at least as far as you know, Arlington Wildlife, but could have done a whole hour on, on just the impact that this rabbit has had in Australia, which it, it's, it's amazing. Uh, and then the work that they have done to try to get rid of the rabbit and how the species has flourished despite essentially the persecution and, and the attempts to eradicate it from uh, the wild, which is, is important because they do have a, a very serious effect. You know, an introduced species cannot just uh, take up um, you know, outcompete local species for Nietzsche's, but they can also spread disease which uh, to other local wildlife, which can be a big deal as well. Uh, but you can see here, you know, this is, uh, um, I don't even I don't really call this a, a brace of conies. I would call this a full on, you know, truck full of, I mean, just the, imagine, uh, the numbers that are there. And you can see that you can have this complete, um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know where I was going to go with this. You can have this just massive number of, 
of rabbits being taken constantly. And this is a very old picture. And they still have issues with rabbits today. They tried to introduce um, a disease that was rabbit specific. I mean, they have worked really hard over there to, to make an impact on the rabbit population. And it's not easy. And, and the rabbits have um, uh, survived and withstood everything that they've thrown at them. Um, so we're going to talk about a nicer, gentler rabbit. Uh, this is the American, uh, the Eastern Cottontail. You can see a couple of isolated patches out west, and I'm not sure if those are introductions or not. It didn't uh, say with this um, with this range map. But you can see the eastern half of the U.S., a little bit up into Canada, not quite up into New England. There's actually a New England species of Cottontail. Um, but, you know, all the eastern U.S., this is pretty much the primary rabbit. I mentioned there was a couple others in the state, but most of those are... Most of the other ones are, are stuff that you're going to find in, in uh, more mountainous areas, and so you're not going to see as many of them. You're certainly not going to see them around Arlington. This is our rabbit, is the uh, the eastern cottontail. Uh, this is, if you're a cottontail, this is what you want. You want this open space. You know, it's a little brushy, which is nice. You want spaces to hide. Uh, you know, an open field next to... Um, a lot of, uh, of brush, of shrubbery, of trees. That's the kind of, of place you want to go so that <clears throat> excuse me, you can find the grass and the, um, the low um, herb species that you're going to eat. Um, and, you know, if there's danger, you've got a, a quick place to go and bolt. You know, it does leave you open to um, uh, certain kinds of predators. Obviously, if you're out in, in this, like this open space, you know, um, raptors are... are, are might be a little bit easier to find you, but they, they do have a, a decent camouflage. That, that brown color is not going to stand out. Um, and obviously, this is where foxes and, and coyotes hunt, um, and they hunt for rabbits. But this is the that exceptional uh, kind of um, place that they like. I don't, I, I've seen rabbits in Arlington. I haven't seen a lot. Uh, if you if you come here to Gulf Branch, the, the place to go and really see them is out by the um, the tennis courts in Old Glebe, uh, which is opposite from where the, the nature center is. That's typically where I found them. We have a big field um, east of that 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 is opposite of where uh, Madison Community Center is. Uh, but I don't know that I've ever seen any in there. I think I've just mainly seen them around the um, or by that that piece where the tennis courts are. And again, there's a lot of cover there, which is probably the reason. Uh, rabbits don't, they don't dig a hole for themselves. Females, you know, may dig a, a hole for their young, um, but they're just going to create what's called a form. And essentially, it's a it's a spot that they can, uh, you know, dig out a little bit or, or pat down. So it's just mild depression in the ground. Uh, and they spend a lot of time loafing there. They uh, spend a lot of time redigesting. They spend a lot of time... Um, uh, grooming. Uh, grooming is their second uh, largest activity besides foraging. You spend a lot of time grooming. Um, if you were out and about with uh, fe females, groom pretty uh, regularly right after nursing. They, they groom right away. Uh, they'll groom after courtship. Um, rabbits will groom after um, pretty much anything they do. Um, they spend a lot of time in the form grooming. This is kind of an open spot, and, and sometimes they will choose an open spot where they can kind of catch some some rays. Um, but this is not, you know, that's not tip, always typical. They love brush piles. They do like a, a lot of vegetation around their form so that it's, you know, almost like they're walled in or like these curtains of brush or, or plants that make it hard or, or near impossible to, to see them. Maybe there's just a small little gap that they can move in to get into their form. So that's their, their preferred uh, type of area there. Uh, daily schedules, you can see they, they live a pretty tough life. You know, a couple hours after sunrise, they go out and forage for a little bit. Uh, spend the rest of the day loafing in and around their for, their form. Uh, they can groom and digest, but let's you know let's call it what it is loafing. Um, the, the one of the books I was reading doing this, they literally referred to it as loafing, which I thought was great. Um, you know, a lot of I, I think we're very regimented. You know, we got you know third of our day ideally we spend sleeping. The other two thirds of the day we spend doing all kinds of things, um, but we don't have these quick bursts of activity like some of these other critters do, and it, and it definitely changes how they do it. And also, not having a house with a lock, I think, really changes how um, soundly you can sleep as a, as a critter, you know, how many times you wake, how many times you're started. And so, um, they tend to rest more, which 
you know, seems, you know, it can, some people can feel a little, I think, judgy about, but it's really about, you know, making sure you've got the energy you need because somebody's going to chase you and try to eat you at some point. Uh, and so you want to be ready for that. Um, so as I mentioned, they'll forge a couple hours after sunrise, uh, and then they'll forge for an hour or so after sunset as well. Um, and so those are their two main foraging times. I've seen them referred to as diurnal. I've seen them referred to as crepuscular. Um, certainly their foraging sounds more crepuscular, although you know, they're pretty active during the day, and they do sleep at night, but they are always alert. Rabbits will sometimes stop. They'll you know, be doing whatever they're doing, and they just stop and freeze. They look around and they're listening and then pretty soon they go back. Um, I don't know if you notice, they do have some large ears. Those large ears really help funnel sound in. Uh, rabbits have eyes on the side of their head, uh, like many prey species. Um, it reduces their binocular vision because their overlap is uh, between the two, what the two eyes see is much smaller, um, but they're not pouncing, you know, or chasing down wild clover. You know, the clover just sits there, the plants just sit there. So whatever they're eating doesn't going to go very far. Um, so, you know, when they pop, when they take that moment, when they take that pause every 10, 15 minutes, whatever um, the rabbit feels it needs to do, you know, they'll just randomly stop and look. And of course, if certainly if there's a sound, if there's a smell, if there's something that looks wrong, you know, that'll cause them to freeze as well. And very often, um, you know, a lot of people think of how fast rabbits are and all that hopping and running they're doing, but very often uh, freezing is their first line of defense to figure out what they're seeing or what is, is coming out to them before they decide what course of action to take, uh, which again is usually running. Uh, so if it's time to go a slow hop, uh, if it's safe, the marsh rabbit can actually walk with all four legs moving independently like, you know, you see your cat or your dog. Uh, but our cottontail, what it's going to do is it's sitting there and if it decides to move forward, it'll put the, it'll lean forward so that the front two legs come down and it'll step with the front two legs and then bring both back legs forward together. Okay, and so you'll get on the left here, you'll get this um, front back uh, formation of the front two feet. Uh, and then the two leading feet are actually the rear feet that come forward of the front feet. And so, you know, and that's the gait that they repeat and that's their slow hop or their, their locomotion. You know, if, if things are safe, they're just moving from one spot of grass to the other to, to browse and eat. Um, it's very similar to squirrels, but when squirrels run, their back feet will come forward to their front feet, but their front feet are always next to each other. Uh, this is from a book called, I'll show it again at the end. Uh, tracking in the Art of Seeing. It's by Paul Resendez. It's a fantastic book about tracks uh, and sign and scat and, and what you're seeing out there and, and recognizing um, all these different things. And it's mostly mammals, uh, but I, I, I really recommend that book if you really want to get better at some of the, the field lore, like, you know, looking at tracks and scat and, and feeding sign. Um, does a great job of telling you the difference between whether a squirrel or a mouse ate, or a chipmunk ate that acorn or not. Um, is it time to go? Is it not safe? Uh, they can bound at speeds of 18 miles per hour. They can clear 10 feet in a single bound. They can really move. Uh, and then, you know, zigzag motion. There's no sense in running straight. You know, what if the critter that's coming after you is actually faster than you? And so using the zigzag motion can make it harder. And I'll come back to that because that zigzag motion plays into something else, which is uh, um, a um, adaptation that's really neat. But uh, I don't want to touch that till the end. It's my teaser to keep you here the whole time. Uh, and sometimes you have to swim. Uh, Eastern cottontails will swim. They, it's a little doggy paddle they can do if they need to. This is actually a uh, swamp rabbit or marsh rabbit. Uh, I think DJF lists them as uh, marsh rabbits. I like swamp rabbit. I don't know why. I just think it sounds cooler. Um, but one of the things the swamp rabbits will do is, you know, after they swim, they actually jump out of the water and then run back across the log, you know, double back to use their... Um, you know, to, to keep, to try to lose their scent and make it harder for critters to find them. Uh, so these are really neat critters. Um, so you spend all this time running, you spend all this time grooming. What are you going to eat? Well, let's munch on some clover. Um, this clover looks munch. I don't think that that's um, actually rabbits because I'm pretty sure rabbits would bite off at the stem and eat the whole thing. Um, but clover is, is one of their big foods. They like a lot of grass uh, and, and leafy plants. They'll eat some flowers. They'll eat some fruits and, and um possibly even some nuts i don't think that they eat acorns i think they're one of the few animals that i that i actually can list that aren't acorn eaters when there's so many that are uh, but this is their nice summer remember lots of leafy leafy greens and things like that and again this is the stuff you're going to find at the rabbits level in fields and open areas and along the edges okay but when we get to winter it's a whole different story 
There's not a lot of good green leafy stuff, you know, go out right now. Uh, and rabbits are active year round. They don't hibernate. So when it's cold, they'll still go out and forage on top of the snow. So they got to look for different things. Now, if they're on top of the snow, that might help them help elevate them a little bit. They're going to do things like chew on um, bark. They're going to eat bark. They're going to get that layer just underneath the bark, kind of like what, what beavers eat, you know, the, the, that um, cambium, which is really good stuff. And they'll eat twigs. Um, and here's a, a neat piece of field lore you can really impress somebody with. So these twigs across the bottom were chewed by cottontails or rabbits. It might be other species. For sure, it's, 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 it's rabbits. I think it's cottontails. But up on top here, these are all twigs that were chewed by deer. And hopefully what you can see is on these twigs on the bottom, you've got almost, a, especially this one right here, fourth one from the left in case you can't, on the bottom row in case you can't see my cursor. This one's got a nice clean cut, very flat. You know, almost looks like something, you know, machine or precision uh, and at a 45 degree angle. That is how a rabbit chews off a twig, um, you know, or a small piece of a sapling when they go to eat it. That's absolutely a rabbit because rabbits have those incisors on the top and the bottom and they can make a nice clean cut. Up top here, you've got a special one here. This is the fourth one on the top from the right. Uh, and that is a very ragged looking chew bite there and that is something that deer will do deer have incisors in the bottom of their jaw but they don't have any on the top so they rip and tear when they take bites of things and you can be left with this really jagged thing so if you're looking at um you know plants or twigs if you're looking at these that have bite marks on them um you can tell the difference between the two um by how clean they are these nice clean bites here these are all rabbit you know, cottontail up top here these are all white-tailed deer um Oh, there's a com bunch of comments in here. I can't, I can't get to them, but I'll, I will definitely check the comment, the uh, chat uh, at the very end here. Um, one thing I, you know, I don't always pass on to people. I don't, don't want to ruin everybody's feeling, but you're here for a deep dive, so let's talk about it. Rabbits are into coprophagy, and what that means is they eat their poop. They don't eat all their poop. These hard feces, these are what you're going to find when you're out there and you see it, <clears throat> what looks like a pile of cocoa puffs. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, um, if you're going on one of my old co-workers uh, hikes, it might be Cocoa Puffs. If she eats them, you know it's Cocoa Puffs and not actual feces. Um, but these look like hard, you know, a hard chocolatey cereal like Cocoa Puffs. Those are the second poop. This right here, the cecotrope, this is the first poop. When a, a rabbit does here, uh, and, and these are, this is from, I think this is from a, a domestic rabbit presentation. Um, one of the things I read about cottontails is they eat it as it comes out. They you know, it, they start to poop and they're just grabbing it and eating it right back up. It sounds really gross, but you've got a, a small animal here who eats plants and plants are uh, in the, the, the lignin and cell walls is notoriously uh, hard to digest. And so what's going to happen is um, when that second set of uh that's that first rather um uh, passing of feces comes out there's still a lot of good stuff in there there's still a lot of, of nutrients that you don't want to lose and so the rabbits eat it a second time and digest it a second time and what that actually does is that essentially um doubles the length of their gut you know granted it's going through the same gut twice but now they're extending it they're doubling it the amount of processing that that uh plant material um uh, goes through in the gut so that they can get the most nutrition out of it. So these these hard feces that can, can, essentially, yeah. Good question. Good question. Sure. Can they tell which? So they can tell which one is the first time through. First time through. Or is that everything? Yeah. If you look, this is it's 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 not the best quality picture here because uh, this is really it's a screen grab. Um, but if you look, these look, uh, hopefully these look a little coarser. These look a little smoother, almost shiny. They actually look wet. I feel like there's a, there's more moisture still retained in this this first round of droppings than the second. Um, and, and, you know, I can't, obviously I can't speak to the nervous system of a rabbit. I don't know if maybe it feels different coming out. You know, maybe it's, it's softer and there's just a different uh, texture. But uh, I'm sure there's some instinctual advantage. And maybe there's a smell. I don't know. But they do. They eat that first round. They don't eat the second. These are the, the feces you'll find in the field when you find rabbit feces. And they're like sawdust. You know, they're really devoid of moisture. They've really been processed through. Obviously, I'm not going to recommend trying them to see if there's any nutrition left. But, you know, this is what rabbits do. And so th this is really important. They can't, you know, they don't um, uh, have the, the long uh, digestive system of like a ruminant, like a cow, where they can cough up the chud and rechew it and try cough up the cud and rechew it and try again. This is um, 
you know, this is how they maximize that digestion is they eat that first round of feces um, to make sure they get everything out of it. I've been doing a preschool set of preschool programs this month and, and this month's theme is rabbits and I've been kind of staying away from this one when I ask the kids if they want to be a rabbit because I'm not sure if it'll be it'll be something that they don't want or if it'd be more of something that they do want but um, um, this is one of those things where I don't think a lot of people realize that rabbits do this and again I don't think it's it's anything we should be judging the rabbits about but uh, it is one of those interesting things that an adaptations a behavioral adaptation they do to maximize uh, the ability of their body to uh, digest and get the nutrients out that they need you know, so you'll, you'll find a lot of, of critters that eat plants like this that very often spend a lot of time eating food rapidly um, because they're either going to pop it up later and chew it again like cows or they're going to, you know, reduce and reuse and recycle. Whoops, reduce, reuse that cycle that um, that feces at least one time and try to maximize what they're getting out of there. So we know where these guys live. We know where these guys eat. Let's answer one of those hard questions that people always talk about, which is, do rabbits really you know, reproduce as much as people say they do? Uh, and they are able to do it. Um, I decided not to get in the weeds with, because I could probably do a, an entire half hour on, on just all the different um, nuances to, to mating, but uh, go over some of the highlights. Uh, there is a hierarchy among males. And so oftentimes, um, I read that they're not territorial. I read that they are. You know, I don't think that they're very very territorial as a species. Males can tend to be more territorial, especially during the mating season. The mating season itself is, is can be pretty long. Um, one of the things that, um, I'll talk about the reason for that later, but um, so the males might have a hierarchy. We have a couple of dominant males and those males spend a lot of time running off uh, the other more subordinate or submissive males. Um, the males have also have to spend time uh, courting the female. They'll follow the female, they'll sniff her backside, she'll move forward. Uh, the females are pretty aggressive towards um, males that are looking for a, uh, a chance to mate. Uh, but as the female begins to enter estrus, they become a lot less aggressive towards the males. At the same time as the males start to become more aggressive because they can smell that that time is getting nearer. Okay, um, I wanna make sure I knew where I was on the, on the slide there. Um, and so you know, the males spend a lot of time sniffing if they get to that courting part, they might run at each other. And this that's what's happening here is one of the, the male or the females running at the other and the other jumps over um, the partner. And so this is all part of that the courtship uh, can be pretty elaborate. For the male, um, you know, there, there's a lot of work to be done here. So let's let's look at some of these vital stats because this will this will tell some of the story. If you're somewhere like Alabama or you're a little further south where spring starts earlier and the warm weather will last longer. You could start as early as July, or excuse me, as, as January for your first for your first litter, and go all the way through into October. And remember, it might be warmer in November, December there, but October is when you're actually having the young, uh, you know, and then you still got to give them time to develop. Uh, Wisconsin, which is much further north, you know, we're about midway between the two. You know, late March through late August is is going to be closer to your time, and late August or early September might be really pushing it as far as getting that one last litter um, weaned and, and ready to to go on their own. Uh, a female can have a new litter every month. Their pregnancy lasts about twenty eight days, um, and within. A female, I think, believe if I remember correctly, goes into estrus as soon as she has the litter, which is which is crazy. Uh, a, a female born in the spring can have her first litter before winter, so she can uh, be born, uh, develop, move out on her own, and then mate and have a, a first litter before winter. Uh, again, it, just, it moves very quick with the species. Uh, they have a seven-day estrus cycle. It culminates in a single hour when in estrus and represent receptive. So that's part of what I wanted to say here is that, you know, it, it's, I see so many species where the males are just ob obnoxious, sometimes bordering on nearly homicidal, you know, just in their their drive to reproduce and, and what happens to the females. And, and um, you know, what, like the wood frogs are out right now and you know, they're constantly calling and a female comes in the pond and the wood frogs, if they, the males, if they see her, they just all start chasing her. And it seems, you know, so obnoxious by human standards. Um, but, you know, here, when you realize that there's a single hour when that female will be estrus and, and, and the first initial um, 
um, that first initial estrous cycle, it, you know, the females are their own. The rest of the time here, um, you know, when the females going through this and the males are courting and they're being really obnoxious and they're doing the chasing or they're doing the, the, the bum sniffing and the female moves forward and they sniff her again and she moves forward again. Um, you know, after that first litter, the, the females in the middle of making a nest for the litter that she's pregnant with, um, and she's making a nest and she's re being receptive to these males and then she's making the nest and then she has the babies and she comes out within an hour. She may have already made it again um, to have another litter in the next 28 days. I mean, it just it, it almost seems like a um, assembly line. It's just it's just it's just nonstop. And so, you know, northern litters are bigger, uh, but fewer. So they might have five or six young. Um, but there might only be four litters, whereas in the south they might have more litters, maybe six, seven, possibly even eight, um, but only like two to three young per litter. Um, but a single female can produce 35 young each year. I feel like there's, I don't know if you guys can see it, but I feel like there's another line I had below here, um, and I'm not seeing that last line. You, you get this little uh, overlap on my um, screen. But I want to read a passage from this one book because it's really tells you something about how how much this moves. Um, oh, OK, and here's what I was talking about for the first cycle. Other than the first cycle of the year, estrus occurs immediately after birthing a new litter. The general pattern of behavior is the same, except that the females may be simultaneously making and lining nests during the last hour of chasing. The final chase ending in copulation often occurs when the female emerges from her nest within an hour of having given birth. No rest for the female rabbit. Um, I'll sh and again, I'll show you what, what book I read that out of. Um, so they have the young, like I said, they might dig a hole, you might have these forms. I, I've seen many times where um, um, somebody's mowing their lawn and they come across the nest and it, sometimes it's ugly and sometimes it, you know it's very lucky, um, you know, but they'll find this, this rabbit's nest and then you hope that they'll, um, uh, hope that they'll move and that the, the rabbits will be protected. Um, but what's really neat about this is when the rat, when the the female's making the nest, you know she's she's gathering vegetation and, and leaves and, and soft stuff. But she lines the nest with her own um, body fur. She doesn't really pull it from the abdomen, but she does pull it from other places around her. And what's happening is. Anyway, I, I like the idea that she's re reusing, reusing and recycling her, her fur. Um, we're at spring and it's at this point where most uh, mammals around here will be shedding their winter coat, their long, thick fur for shorter, thinner fur for their summer coat. And so she's helping that process along and using the fur to line her nest for her young so they have soft. So uh, I think that's pretty neat. Um, the young are born with their eyes closed. They're not they don't hit the ground ready to go with um, like a, a fawn would. Uh, they do spend a lot of time playing and chasing each other, and, you know, jumping, um, twisting and turning. Those are the kinds of things that need to learn as adults to uh, evade predators. Um, so, um, well, oh, and I want to talk about this. Uh, one of the, the neat um, critters that you'll, I don't know how much these are really in our state. Um, certainly north and, and west of here, you're going to find um, snowshoe here. Apparently they they used to have them uh, when I lived in Northeast Ohio. There were some there as well. The only one I've ever seen is this this guy in the middle uh, was up in Colorado, which is really neat. But snowshoe hair, when they go through their shedding, their seasonal shedding, they actually switch colors. They go from a white pelage that they have in the winter for obvious camouflage reasons to a brown pelage, again, for obvious camouflage reasons. Um, I remember learning this Sometimes I feel like my deep dives are a crusade to tell you all what I learned in elementary school and where it went wrong. Um, and, and it's generally true, but again, I, I'm, I'm fond of saying they don't read the book. And so if you look at this map, this is a really neat map from, uh, uh, I found in an article on uh, uh, scholastic.com. This is, uh, you know, the range of, they use a really, really distorted map, but uh, the range of snowshoe hairs, and you can see the white hairs, um, are blue. This is what they are, what color they are during the winter. Uh, they get, they go blue, they go white during the winter and the ones, the green part of the range is where you'll find some white and some brown and the red part of the range is where they stay brown year round. And I thought that was really interesting. So they, it's not an obligate thing. Um, there are I think more than 20 different species of where um, you'll find this, this color change that coincides obviously with the season to help 
um, provide camouflage during the, the winter and the summer. The tough thing though is when your predator also does <laughs> the the coat change, um, like I think the Arctic fox and obviously this this um, this weasel here. Uh, I think this is an ermine. I think it's the ermine that does this. That's the weasel species. Um, you know, it doesn't really confer any advantage because your predator is doing the same thing. Um, one of the other important things to talk about is the birth rate. You can argue that the birth rate is very high. I sometimes I wonder if this is the chicken or the egg, but the birth rate for rabbits is really high because if you didn't have a high birth rate, you wouldn't have a lot of rabbits left because they are such an important uh, food source for so many animals. This is this is a red fox, but there are a lot of predators of uh, cottontails. You know that'll take advantage of that meal. Hawks and owls. Uh, that's uh, we got a mink here. You get the coyote and the bobcat, uh, even raccoons, which I'm sure are not going to chase the cottontail. But if they can get a, their paws on one, they certainly won't. You know, hesitate to do that. Uh, and some large snakes. Here's this is a rat snake. I don't know how often they eat cottontails, but um, I think they've got the right size too. You know, and so there are uh, a lot of predators that will eat that, and some um, that depend on certain species of rabbit. Uh, pretty regularly and so rabbits have this mystique of being um, really um, really good uh, at reproducing I think there's a Bugs Bunny joke that if there's one thing rabbits know how to do it's multiply um, but that's because there's there's such a, a pressure against them um, I, I you know I, there are some species of mice I'm pretty sure that can put rabbits to shame which with the amount of mice they can add each year if left unchecked uh, and it's for the same reason mice are another f staple food source and if you're a predator and you eat small mammals mice are on the list you know and so ha being able to reproduce as often as they do is one way to keep that st that um, population stable. One thing I read that I found was really interesting. We're about to have the cicadas show up this year, and I can't wait to just spend a month talking about them. Um, but the thought behind the idea that these these 17 year cicadas, instead of coming out every year like the three and five year cicadas, which we hear every summer, the dog day cicadas, one of the reasons they they um, synchronize is because there's so many of them. It's called a predator satiation hypothesis. They can't possibly eat all the cicadas when they come out you know and so and then having such a large prime number either 13 or 17 makes it impossible for any kind of predator to time a life cycle around um taking advantage of that food source so the animals that are here when they do come out it's great for them but they're going to go right back to normal numbers the following year um one of the things i read is that um you'll often find that in areas where there's a lot of cottontails, they synchronize when the litters come out. So at the same time that the rabbits over here have their litters, the rabbits over here do. So there's a, uh, that synchronization is on a somewhat smaller scale in the cicadas, but the same kind of idea that there's so many litters that they the predators can't possibly nail them all and eliminate them all. And so that there's, as they're, as they're all having babies at the same time, that large number of young rabbits in the area um, actually protects them by making sure that they can't all possibly be eaten at the same time, uh, which is really interesting. And, and I'm not sure how that works, but, um, and again, I, I read it in a good book, not you know, like something on Wikipedia, but it was a really interesting idea. Um, and of course, when you've got babies on the ground, there are some critters that might not be too fast, uh, but they're still, you know, willing to take some food as well. You know, we don't have badgers here in the East or not anymore. Um, they came at least as far as the Midwest and like Ohio at one point. Um, but Virginia possum and striped skunk we still have, and they'll certainly take advantage of them, of young rabbits if they can find them and, and, and snag them out of a nest. So there's a lot of, again, there's a lot of predators that will be happy to take advantage of, um, of uh, a cottontail meal. Um, if you went through, um, generally called you with me a few years ago when I was doing this for Armin. You know, this is one of those classic, oops, sorry. This is one of those classic um, graphs that you see that shows predator play relationship. It's one of the, I think this is, yeah, as you can see, it's from the early 1900s. Um, and you can see as the numbers of the, this is the snowshoe hare and this is the lynx. The snowshoe hare, I think, makes up like 75 or 80% of the lynx's diet. It's a significant piece of that diet. And so um, as snowshoe hair numbers go so does the lynx so you can see 
each year as the snowshoe hair numbers are going up, the lynx numbers are going up and the lynx numbers are still going up here. But as they get higher, obviously that drops the hair number some because of the predation. So then when the hair numbers go down, the lynx numbers go down and then the hair numbers go back up because the lynx numbers went way down and the lynx numbers come back up and they go down and they cycle together. And so for many of these critters, that's how important rabbits can be to them, that they're such an important food source. And so losing them is there. Uh, obviously, if you remember some of the images I've shown you from Australia, there isn't anybody that depends on uh, rabbits for food there, quite like uh, some of our North American species. Um, and I want to talk about that tail. That tail has always bothered me because it's just a tiny little fluff. And I've, I've always wondered if it was one of those um, sexually selected things that's where the, the gene for the tail is attached to another gene that's actually very important that is sexually selected for against, uh, and this one is not, but because it's on the same uh, chromosome or in the same general area, uh, genetically speaking, that it gets uh, perpetuated but doesn't really have any any value. Um, and you can look at these critters, you know, you got a squirrel that uses his tail for balance, um, foxes that can curl up with their tail over their face to help keep warm. The obvious sexual, dis uh, you know, display of the the peacock here and the rattlesnake, which whose tail is is a, a passive warning to uh, potential predators of the the venomous nature of the rattlesnake and, and the danger of messing with it. You know, these are all obvious uh, reasons for having a tail. And then you got this guy with this little ball of fluff at the back. And, and what does that really mean? Um, I, I've read I read somebody's blog and they said, you know, the rabbit can still use it for balance because when the rabbit moves one way, the tail moves the other way. And I, and I wanted to gently put a comment on it because that's the tail because the tail is on the end of the spine. And when the rabbit moves one way, it moves the other way, just like on a pivot on the end of, um, you know, a board or something that you're pivoting. One end is going to go the other direction. Uh, it just very unlikely it has anything to do with balance. What I did find out was some interesting stuff that it's it's thought to be a, um, some people thought it was a visual signal. It was a warning to other critters and certainly other rabbits that there's danger and they went running. Um, there's definitely a lot of indication that it has some social uh, importance that when it's held down, the, the rabbit is very placid, it's very calm. When it's held up, that indicates an agitated state for the rabbit and it could be a signal to other certainly to you know males uh, by females. Um, one really interesting article I read, and I don't know if this is true or not, um, there's, a, there's a thought that, you know, as the rabbit runs, that white tail is going to be what the predator cues on, so it distracts the, like an eye spot would distract a, a predator eating a fish from the actual eye, that that might be a spot that it distracts the predator from the bulk of the animal's body and gives it a better chance to escape. Um, I read one theory and there was a whole, this guy did a whole test with a video game and some some people, and I, I don't know the entire validity of it, but it, it sounded promising, but it needed to be explored more, where his thought was that, you know, if you're watching a cottontail run and you see that tail and all of a sudden it zigs and you don't see that tail anymore, but you were still depending on that light, so in low light or darker light, what could happen is if you're depending on that tail, the zero and the cottontail, and then it moves, it changes its angle, and you don't see that tail, you've lost the cottontail. And that maybe it gives you something to focus on to then just take it away and make it harder for you to actually spot or continue to chase the cottontail as you're pursuing it as a predator. Um, and what, the, what the guy did was he developed a video game with these cottontails and then he had hunters and he had it in quotes, which I don't didn't really, I think, help his case. You know, like these 20 or 24 people do it. And many of them found it difficult once the, the simulated rabbit changed direction and they couldn't see the tail anymore. Uh, and many of them lost it because of that. And, he felt this was really, really good evidence for that. And I think it was a good starting point. Um, but it is an interesting idea that that bright spot on the tail uh, could actually be, could actually help function as a, as a distraction for the predator uh, and then make it easier for the rabbit to hide when it drops the tail down so it can't be seen. Um, so I want to share that because the, the, the tail has always bothered me. <clears throat> um, and rabbits um, have a lot of uh, parasites, they have a lot of diseases um, that can affect their mortality. If you look closely at this uh, little bunny, this is in Colorado, um, in this park there were several, uh, I did a big tick check after I got home, I didn't be in this park because there were several rabbits and they had these big ticks in their ears. Um, and you know, there's tick-borne diseases of course, and there's uh, other diseases, diseases that can be spread uh, and rabbits tend to suffer from them. Um, there was a study in Kansas that looked at mortality and the highest number of mortality highest mortality for rabbits was predation. And the rabbits in the study, it was between 40 and 45% were um, 
killed by predation. But the next high, two highest was automobile collisions and tularemia. And tularemia is a is a um, a, a disease from the parasite, if I remember correctly. So they, you know, there was a really high mortality. Um, and there's about a 20% annual survival rate of rabbits. You know, one only one in five rabbits is going to survive to the following year. Um, and the average, you know, lifespan is 15 months, which is ridiculous. I did tell the kids in my group that I'm like, because their kids are age three to five. And I'm like, how many of you are older than two? And they all raise their hands. I'm like, most rabbits don't live to the age of two. And that's when most of the kids are like, yeah, I'm not going to be a rabbit after all, Mr. Ken. Thanks for teaching us. Uh, they lost interest in being a rabbit really quick after that. Um, but it, it is tough to be a rabbit in um, in the wild. You know, there's a lot of, of pressures and that is, I think, an, another reason, not just the high mortality or the high predation, but just the high mortality in general, um, that it benefits that species if you have individuals that can reproduce and reproduce quickly. Um, so I'm sure some people are thinking, oh man, that sounds like horrible to just, you know, you, babies after babies after babies, but that's what this this species needs to do because of its niche, because of its importance as a prey species. Um, that's what it needs to do to to survive. So on that happy note, you know, I hate to leave you with our hero in distress or worse, um, but that is all I have for tonight. That's the end. I'm a big Bugs Bunny fan, so you guys are going to have to see a couple of those images tonight. Um, but that's what I have for you. I saw there was a lot of messages through in the chat, so I'm actually going to stop sharing. Uh, and show you my face. And if anybody wants to unmute and answer their questions, and I'm going to check the chat uh, and see what's in there so I can answer any questions that anybody may have. Uh, or if you just want to shout out your question right away, that's I'm happy to. Oh, rabbits are everywhere. OK, thanks, Peter. Apparently, I don't go to the rabbit spots. <laughs> that's funny. I uh, hear somebody. Go ahead. Can do? Are there, are there any native plants that are rabbit resistant? Oh, that um, I'm I'm I sadly I, I'm not the guy uh, to ask that question. That is a tough one. You know, I don't know. They and again, they like leafy stuff. Um, the rabbit resistance when I grew up was my aunt sending the dog out in the backyard to run around the garden and bark the rabbits back into the brush. Um, I, I don't know. That is that is not a question for me. I'm going to tell you what. I will actually look that one up. Uh, and when I send out my follow up email, which I swear to all of you is going to be much quicker than last month's was because I sent it yesterday. Um, I'll see if I can find a list or, or a link or, or get something and get back to you on that because that's a really good question. Um, I'm not a gardener, so I don't think of, I don't think in those regards. But let me see if I can find something that I can share with everybody because that's a really good question. It's funny again the the comment that I need to get around Arlington more and and and, and it's probably true you know I, I spend most of my time here at the nature center and in the forest here we just it's not a great spot I, I've seen them on the WNOD trail and in a couple of other open areas but um that's uh that's interesting I'm glad to hear there's a lot more rabbits than I thought in the Arlington area you can definitely see their, their population. What's that? I would say you can definitely see the population fluctuate. Like, like there'll be like down years where you see any, and then yeah, like, seven years where it's just like you're like tripping up on like through, you know, the I was like, it's like. Yeah, it's it's funny too because the other thing I noticed is you know some of my pictures I feel like I'm looking at those rabbits I'm like those are really small rabbits like maybe you know young of the year and maybe it's I saw them because they're not experienced enough to be like I gotta get out of here there's a human there. Um, but uh, yeah, that it's it's. I had one, it's, run, run across my foot. I think it was a little guy. I think that's true. Like if you want to get really close to them, the little the little baby rabbit sire. Uh, yeah, and they're they're adorable. Yeah. They're adorable, but I'm I'm always worried for them. I'm like, please please have better choices. Neighborhood cats and neighborhood dogs will absolutely uh, catch and eat rabbits and and kill rabbits. Um, weasels, which are much smaller. Other than cats are very good at catching um, uh, rabbits. You know, I showed that old picture of people using rab uh, weasels or uh, ferrets to catch rabbits. There are people that still do that today that use ferrets to hunt rabbits. 
Um, and so uh, at neighborhood cats can absolutely um, be big predators of rabbits, especially on young rabbits. And I've had num numerous people tell me, you know, that they're outdoor cat brought in rabbits and it's just not an outdoor cat guy. I, I, I have strong opinions on that and I, um, I, I feel it's not good for the wildlife that's out there. And, and I mean, cats are hunters. That's that's their instinct. Um, but yes, neighbor cats will absolutely go after rabbits. Yeah, yeah it's funny. I, oh, go ahead. Do rabbits reuse their nests? That's a really good question. One of the things I read is that they'll, um, they might have several spots that they'll use in an area and they might move their litter around. So I, I think they might, but I think if you're, you know, if it's disturbed or, or you notice it or pay too much attention to it, they're like, no, they'll, they'll do a new one. Um, but I, I can imagine it's, you know, again, you know, once she's on that essentially assembly line of babies, 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 it can't be that easy. But I guess if she's got nothing else to do, um, you know, if the female's got nothing else to do. And I don't know that the, the males do a whole lot other than bother the female every 28 days a, a lot. Um, I don't know that they really help with any any raising of the young, and so um, it's up to them. I would like I would like to think that it would make sense to reuse them, but maybe um, you know once you've got the the baby rabbit scent in there and they've been they've been pooping or peeing in there, and you got that scent, it's just not safe to use again, especially because it's on the ground. Um, I see there a comment from Lisa says we go from lots of rabbits in our neighborhood to then seeing foxes often and no rabbits it changes about every two years, and that sounds about right. Um, they used to have. They were, I remember when I first started, they were telling stories over at Long Branch about how they had um, their flying squirrel program, and they would have the one night they had like 13 flying squirrels. They had these ridiculous numbers of flying squirrels. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then the barred owls moved in to the park and were nesting there, which was great. But then like, yeah, maybe we get one, two, maybe three squirrels in the night, and it's really, you know, it changes once you get that predator. They find that food source. It's going to change the numbers of of prey species that are in the area. And if we know how many rabbits we have in our area, I, I don't know of any census um, that we'd be done for those. It'd be interesting. It'd be interesting if we could figure that out. Um, I think the tough thing to, would be doing that in an urban area. We can have a lot of people interfere. Um, you know, or it might not be as easy unless you could do something with like game cameras where it's not going to, you know, it's, it's a very passive of way of um, calculating those numbers. Do we have marsh rabbits in our area? No, um, I don't think so. Um, I'm going to talk really slow and stutter a little bit until I get to my book here. Um, but I'm going to see if I can pull up a, a range map. But I don't think so. Um, there are in Virginia, like you could see this here, but I don't think that's what you're going to find. I think that that's much more southern rabbit. Oh, you know what? It is. It is. Now I remember. Um, that's like south central state. So you're looking at... Your swamp rabbit, marsh rabbit, king cutter rabbit. That is, you're looking at Texas, Oklahoma, uh, a little bit of Kansas across to um, uh, Alabama, Georgia, maybe a little bit of South Carolina and, Car and North Carolina and the, the very eastern edges there. Not even really in Florida or the panhandle. Um, so it's... And again, they're listed by the state, by one of the state agencies as being in here, but that's probably like southwestern uh, Virginia where you have to go to see those. I'd like to, but. Any other questions? Uh, it's, it's Slightly off topic, just something I wanted to quick ask. Um, sure. You said that the uh, um, the, the rabbits seem to like align uh, their like birth cycles, uh, just like the cicadas. Mm -hmm. um, that's like the the reason that like all the wood bugs come out on the same line. Like the, that's like the reason for like the big night kind of. A, well, we're one of the reasons for like the big yeah. night of amphibians too, right? Yeah, I think so. That predator satiation you know thing it just it it you can't possibly eat them all um and there's not a lot of of critters i think that take advantage of that you know uh raccoons and skunks obviously some of the owls and some of the hawks will take advantage of the uh the, the wood frog movement but there's just not going to be enough of them 
taking advantage of it to really wipe out a group. Um, you know, at this point, I think the the biggest chance of wiping out one of these wood pop frog populations would be if we bulldoze one of the the, the ponds. We're not going to do that. Um, but no, I mean, you know, we could have a, a bigger impact than the the predators, and that and that works out in their favor. And then again, if you you know you go out and look at the the egg masses, I think they had 180 egg masses at Long Branch. I know we had over, I think over 110 here, you know, and you got, I think maybe a couple hundred frogs in each egg mass. There's just thousands of tadpoles, excuse me, in the ponds that hatch. Not all of them are going to make it, but not all of them are going to eat, get eaten. And so there's a lot of critters that, that can do that. Um, and that tends to be something you're going to see typically in smaller organisms or organisms that reproduce like that. It's interesting to see it in something um, it, something like that in mammals. It's not something you, you generally see because it does sound like more like something that can have more young like uh, insects or some um, you know cold butter vertebrates. But yeah, it's it's very similar to that um, that idea. I want, I've got cicadas on the head. I can't wait to, to see them. And so I can't believe I didn't pull out the wood frogs for that example. That was a good one. All right, I, it's hard to believe I did. Uh, I, I, I answered everybody's questions, but I hope um, I did. If you have any, you can hang around for another minute or so. If you if you got a question, you don't want to ask it in front of everybody. I can say everybody can leave, and then you can ask your question, uh, or feel free to email me. Um, I have another. Uh, I'm going to be. Uh, thank you, Laura. I'm going to um, be a little self promotional for a minute. We uh, I'm doing one on spring ephemerals on the 23rd, which is two weeks from yesterday. Um, and it says it's full, but it's not, and I can take more people and, and I'm gonna change that with registration. So feel free to register. Uh, and then we are, uh, the county is doing some kind of cherry festival partnership kind of thing. Um, and I'll be doing a program on associates of cherry trees and what kind of critters use our native, uh, cherry trees, uh, for food and in shelter, uh, and the like. So, um, that'll be the 24th. So it's two in a row. Uh, that week, so hopefully um, and get some of you to join me for that and I'll be sending out emails to the Ironman listserv and, and things like that. So uh, thanks everybody for joining me uh, and I'll get that recording out um, uh, as soon as I can. Thanks everybody and have a good evening unless you have another question.